Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Portland's 1991-92 Science, Technology, and Society Lectures. My name is Terry Bristol. I'm the President and Executive Director of the Institute for Science, Engineering, and Public Policy, abbreviated ICEP. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank the co-sponsors of the series, uh, Precision Caspars Corporation, the engineering firm of CH2M Hill, the high-tech PR firm Wagner Edstrom, Oregon Episcopal School, IEEE, which is the Professional Society of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, Oregon Public Broadcasting, and Portland State University. I'd also like to thank the Heathman Hotel, for providing first-class accommodation uh, for our, all our Science Technology Society lectures uh, while they're in Port Portland. Also, the reception uh, tonight uh, after this event for those who uh, have patron tickets uh, is also at the Heathman, and uh, conveniently located next door. In the same uh, next door, whichever way that is from here. Uh, and there is a passage, incidentally, uh, on I believe on the mezzanine level, so you can walk straight into there without having to go outside, if you can find it. <laughs> uh, I want to acknowledge the very important role in the creation of this series uh, played by the science teachers of the Portland Public Schools, uh, who have also been an ongoing source of support and encouragement. Uh, indeed, the study guide, this, if you haven't got one, uh, for this series was uh, conceived by the science teachers and funded in part by a major grant from the Curriculum Development Department of Portland Public Schools. Uh, I want to single out Portland Public Schools Science Specialist Steve Carlson and Director of Curriculum Shirley Glick uh, for special thanks for sharing the vision of this series. And to use industrial jargon, Steve and Shirley have been the champions of this program uh, within the public school system, Portland Public School System. Uh, as part of our relationship with Portland Public Schools this year, uh, Dr. Petrosky spent half a day this morning at Benson High School with about 600 uh, Benson High School students and uh, teachers discussing the pencil. Uh, more to the point, uh, Dr. Petrosky, sorry about that. Uh, I had to do that, didn't I? Uh, Dr. Petrosky gave a very well received uh, presentation based on his most recent book which is, is entitled The Pencil, and subtitled A History of Design and Circumstance. Uh, the environmentalists among you may be interested to know that Henry David Thoreau, the famous author of Walden, plays a very central role in the history of the pencil. So Henry David Thoreau, Walden Pond, the pencil, how so, you ask? Well, uh, a few copies, autographed copies, of Dr. Petrosky's book are uh, on sale in the lobby. And a few copies will be available at uh, Powell's Technical Bookstore if you want to get them over the next week or so. Uh, and the answer to that is all in there. So. <laughs> uh, last item. Uh, ICEP is holding a policy forum tomorrow, uh, morning 9 to 12, at the Red Lion Alloyd Center featuring Dr. Henry Petrosky. The focus of the forum is on engineering and public policy. Uh, following Dr. Petrosky's keynote, there's a panel which includes uh, Dwight Sangre, who's the president of the Oregon Graduate Institute, uh, Gary Parks, who's one of the senior engineering managers uh, for Bonneville Power, and myself. And this will evolve into a discussion uh, of what is to be done. The outcome of this forum will be a white paper stating several goals aiming at, aiming at improving engineering and public policy in Oregon, uh, which we intend to see implemented within the next six months. So if you're interested, in a little think-and-do session on engineering and public policy. We also term this the social management of technology, depending on which side of the fence you come from. Uh, please join us. Uh, if you lose track of the time and place details on that, it is mentioned in your program tonight. And, and the days are not full enough, and the nights are not full enough, and life slips by like a field mouse, not shaking the grass. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Maynard Orm, President and CEO of Oregon Public Broadcasting. Thanks. Thank you very much, Terry, and good evening, everyone. We're delighted to have you here tonight. 
Henry Petrosky is an engineer as well as an historian and philosopher of design and technological process. Born in New York City in 1942, Dr. Petrosky received his bachelor's degree in engineering from Manhattan College in 1963 and was awarded an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Teaching Fellowship for graduate study at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. He taught at Illinois in the Department of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics until 1968 when he completed his Ph.D. In 68, Petrosky was appointed to the faculty at the University of Texas at Austin, and in 1975 joined Argonne National Laboratory to head a new group in fracture mechanics, a field that concerns itself with how materials crack and structures break. In 1980, he joined the engineering faculty at Duke University, where he is now a professor of civil engineering. Petrosky's work has earned him an international reputation as an expert in fracture mechanics, structural dynamics, design, and related areas, including structural failure. His research has been sponsored by the National Science Foundation, and he has published over 60 research articles in various technical journals. He has also distinguished himself by his activities uh, regarding the broader issue of technology and society, and the relationship of engineering to our general culture. Since his graduate school days, Petrosky has written often on topics outside his primary field of technical research. He has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Humanities Center, where he spent a sabbatical year writing the pencil a history of design and circumstance, which Terry just mentioned. More recently, in 1990-1991, Petrosky received a Guggenheim Fellowship, which has enabled him to work on his current book on how engineering shapes our everyday world. Petrosky's work as an historian informs us that interest in the role of failure in successful de design is not a modern concept. He writes that over 4,000 years ago, the Code of Hammurabi was issued as a guideline for life and commerce in Babylon, governing such matters as the status of women, drinking house regulations, and the like. It contains specific references to the construction of dwellings and the responsibilities of the construction workers for the structural safety of the dwellings they built. It stipulated that if a builder builds a house for a man and does not make it make and does not make it make its construction firm and the house which he has built collapses and causes the death of the owner of the house that builder shall be put to death if the owner's son dies as a result of the poor construction then the builder's son is executed and so on pretty strict punishment for sloppy work i must say <laughs> i'm glad those don't exist today i feel sorry for the people who live in the bay area if that were the case uh, these days, the structural reliability of the design of nearly everything in our environment is of critical importance to us and is always taken for granted, it seems. Nuclear power plants, highways and bridges, airplanes, ships, cars, skyscrapers, and shopping malls, whether we're flying in a DC-10, walking along a skywalk in a Kansas City hotel, driving across a bridge near Tacoma, or fishing out of Valdez, Alaska, we all expect engineering design success of public buildings and transportation systems to keep us safe and our environment clean and unspoiled. Our lives depend on it. Is that somehow naive? Makes me think, uh, think about this building, especially on the day after Halloween. I'm just kidding, really. Tonight, Dr. Petrosky will take us through a discussion that is provocative, disturbing, but at the same time optimistic. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Portland and Oregon welcome to Dr. Henry Petrosky. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Orm. I'm very happy to be here. Galileo is known to all of us as a great scientist. There's no doubt about his reputation. What seems to be less well known, however, is the fact that he knew a great deal about engineering. He had tremendous insights into engineering. He published a book in 1638 that in English translation is called Dialogues Concerning Two New Sciences. The book was written in Galileo's mature years after he had seen a lot of the world. He had thought a lot about science, he had thought about engineering, and he had thought about a lot of other things. The book is interesting to historians of science principally because it deals with how bodies move, what causes them to take a certain course under a certain force. 
The way the book deals with this is vintage Galileo. He talks about the heavens. He talks about how grand it is to be able to explain how the heavenly bodies move. And he talks about how grand it is to be able to order the system that enables us to predict what's going to happen. This has come down to us today as the science of dynamics, and it's central to an engineer's education. But this is really the second part of Galileo's book, the more famous part. The first part of Galileo's book, the way it opens up, deals with something much more mundane. And it also deals with it in a different manner. Whereas the dynamics part of the book reads very neatly, reads as science, and talks about the successes of the theories that Galileo is proposing, the first part of the book starts off on a much more humble note. It talks not about the great achievements of engineers or of architects. It talks rather about their embarrassments. Galileo relates stories of how in the 17th century, the um, ships that were being built, then of timber, were causing some awkward moments when they were being launched. The way the ships were built is that uh, ships that had existed and had sailed the seas successfully were scaled up, were made larger. Everyone thought that by being faithful to the geometry of the successful ship, the new larger ship would be just as successful. However, as Galileo relates, this was not the case. There were many surprises when the ships were launched and fell apart. There were also other problems that were occurring. The erection of obelisks was known to be a particularly difficult task. Elaborate procedures had to be followed so that the obelisk would not break under its own weight. Galileo goes on to tell other stories in the first few pages of this book. Among the stories he tells is that nature knows a lot more about how to scale up things. Galileo gives the example illustrated in his book by these two bones. The top bone, he says, represents something like a bird. The bottom bone, something like an animal three times the size. He says, even though the bone on the bottom is three times as long as the bone on the top, it clearly is not just three times across. It's much more across. In other words, the two bones are not geometrically similar. When nature wants to make something larger, she doesn't just scale it up. She does something different. Well, this suggested to Galileo that we have to look beyond geometry to explain how things work and how they break. He went on to give further examples to show that the state of the art of Renaissance engineering left a lot to be desired. He relates a story that comes down to us and generally is known as Galileo's column. The story he relates is that there was a column made of marble that was in storage, and that's why it's horizontal. It was resting on two piles of stones. The story Galileo tells is that someone observing the storage of this column became alarmed and became concerned that it was going to break under its own weight, much as obelisks had broken. This person suggested that in order to obviate that, a third support should be put under the column, roughly in the middle. The argument was that this would help support the weight and prevent failure from occurring. Well, Galileo goes on to explain what did happen in subsequent months. After the column had been supported by a third pile of rocks and had more or less been forgotten. After all, the problem had been taken care of. What happened was that the column was found broken. And this is an illustration from Galileo on the top showing the broken column. The bottom illustration shows what was feared would happen. And Galileo relates this story to show that uh, just because people agree on an approach to a problem or a solution to a perceived difficulty, that's no guarantee that nature is going to listen. What Galileo felt was clearly the case here was that uh, agreement among scientists or engineers 
is no guarantee of success. Everyone had agreed that it was a good idea to support the column with an additional pile of stones. Now what happens here is Galileo is realizing what the problems with structures are. That if we want to build structures, design structures that are safe, the most important thing is to understand how they can fail. Whereas the people looking at that column were so concerned that it could fail in the bottom, as in the bottom picture here, by breaking under its own weight, they totally forgot that by changing the means of support, by making what we t today as engineers would call a design change, a minor detail, they were introducing an alternate way in which it could fail. The engineer's obligation, then as now, is to anticipate all the possible ways in which something can fail, in which something can go wrong. Galileo went on to say that if we want to be able to predict failure, we have to understand not only how geometry influences things, but also how the strength of materials influences things. And this is Galileo's example of how to test the strength of materials. He suggested that if we support a, a marble column from the top, hang weights from it, we would be able to measure how strong it is. Now, of course, this is not very practical, but Galileo was a big one for thought experiments. And conceptually, he was correct. This is essentially the way that the strength of, stone, of, of timber is uh, measured today, or the strength of steel. It's essentially pulled until it breaks. Knowing its breaking point and knowing things about geometry does enable engineers to predict when failure will occur. And then Galileo goes on to talk about what is known today, to this day, as Galileo's problem. An engineer would call it a cantilever beam. The important idea is that it's supported at one end, here shown as a very elaborate wall, on the other end, it's supporting a weight, shown as a rock. The characteristic design problem that faces engineers in designing something so simple as Galileo depicts here, or this balcony, or a marquee over a theater, or anything, is to be able to calculate, to be able to predict beforehand under what conditions the structure will break. That's the essence of design, and that's the essence of engineering. What Galileo recognized is it was more than a problem of simple geometry. It was a problem of uh, uh, combining that geometry with the strength of the material, knowing how the geometry would influence the forces and knowing what the limits of those forces was, were. The idea that Galileo went on to describe in elaborate detail was that if we are going to be able to predict the size that this timber beam, in this case, should be in order to support the weight at a particular distance, then we have to understand how the beam is going to break. He argued that at the wall, marked here at the part AB, that this beam would somehow snap. And this is common to most of our experience. So this is not a terribly revealing detail. But what turns out to be crucial is knowing exactly how it's going to snap there exactly how it's going to break there, how the timber has to resist the forces that are applied at the wall. Well, Galileo made certain assumptions about how this beam was going to fail. And that's really the only way that any engineer can proceed to analyze a problem to design a beam. What he assumed was rather naive by today's standards. But remember, Galileo was attacking this problem for the first time. Today, we expect engineering students to be able to solve this problem in their sophomore year and get it right the first time because we are able to show them what the true behavior of the beam is. The, Gal the, the story of Galileo getting this wrong the first time, as he did, is only to point out to us that even what seem in retrospect to be the simplest problems can be far from obvious even to a genius such as Galileo. Now, to me, this is like a, a model of, of the design process, of the engineering process. The idea to anticipate failure, but properly, and therefore ensure the success of the structure. Galileo recognized this 350 years ago. 
As we heard in the introduction, there was talk of failures even long ago, more long ago than that. There has always been a discussion of failure and success in engineering. The method of engineering to design successful structures has always had to take into account failure in one form or another. Before Galileo, it was thought to be taken into account, to account simply by taking into account the geometry. Since Galileo, we know better. So the question is then, why do things continue to present problems to us? Why do, do there continue to be structural failures, engineering embarrassments? Well, in order to understand that, it's helpful to take a long perspective on the history of engineering, longer than just the time span of a single book, such as Galileo's. And I'd like to do that by looking at bridges, because bridges are really classical engineering structures. They've been around since uh, probably the beginnings of civilization in the form of logs falling across rivers. But by Roman times, they were built to be quite elaborate. This is the Pont de Garde in southern France, a Roman bridge that still stands. And the reason some Roman bridges still stands is that they were built to be quite robust. Stone piled on stone. There were uh, thick piers supporting semicircular arches, a principle that had been learned probably through trial and error by experiencing probably a lot of failures until a certain type of bridge this type worked. For many centuries after the Roman bridge building experience, virtually every bridge was built this way. When a less permanent bridge was built, maybe it might be built of timber, but that was about the variety of bridges that existed before the Industrial Revolution. With the Industrial Revolution, not only came more ambition, but also came new materials. In particular, iron came to be a possible substitute for stone. This is the first iron bridge completed in 1879 across the Severn River. It spans about 100 feet, and it still stands today. An interesting example that will recur in this talk that shows that just because something is done new doesn't mean that it's doomed to failure. The first iron bridge worked and still works. Principally, this is going to happen in engineering. When engineers realize today that they're doing something novel, they take a special care. Because it's novel, it doesn't fall into a pattern. Because it's novel, it's not obvious, perhaps, what could go wrong with it. And therefore, a much more explicit thought process is applied. But what tends to happen is that as time evolves, we become familiar with these structures. And that's where the problem can appear. The introduction of iron caused bridge building to evolve rather quickly. By the 1820s, this bridge could be built. The Menai Straits Bridge, designed by Thomas Telford, completed in about 1825. It spans about 550 feet, and it used iron in a novel way. Instead of designing the iron to be an arch, such as the bridge we just looked at, in imitation of stone, this bridge uses iron in a truly novel way. It uses wrought iron, which was stronger than cast iron, against being pulled apart. It strung, this design strung the wrought iron from towers and hung the roadway from the chains. This was good for several reasons. One is it enabled the bridge to be built without any obstruction of the, uh, of the uh, waterway. Ships could continue to use this waterway throughout the construction process because everything happened from above. This was extremely important because this was a, a crucial waterway for the, for the Admiralty. They didn't want it to be obstructed during construction or after construction. And that's why they didn't allow an arch bridge to be built here. An arch bridge not only needed support during the construction process, but also reduced the headroom, the headway, toward the shore. It was only in the very center of the arch that a clear headway would have been available. With the tricky currents avail uh, uh, existing here, 
that was just simply not acceptable to the Admiralty. And this is typically the kind of constraint that drives engineering to do something novel. That the existing designs were, were, had objections to them for various reasons. And again, this bridge, built in 1824, a rather novel bridge for the time, there were a few others built, but not many of this scale, still stands today. Again, just because something new is tried doesn't mean that it's doomed to failure. Ironically, it seems to be just the opposite. Now, what happened? Well, after this bridge was built, there was a need for railroads to cross that same strait. And railroad bridges needed to be much stiffer and much stronger than the Menai Straits Bridge that we were just looking at. There were many, many proposals because it was not believed that a suspension bridge was a possibility. The roadway was simply too flexible. The uh, roadway was not felt to be reliable enough. Because it was so light and flexible, it was susceptible to being blown apart in the wind. And when it was blown apart in the wind, that would mean that the service on the railroad would be interrupted. And that would not be good business. So people proposed things like this that they would build an arch bridge which would be uh, substantial enough to support heavy railroad locomotives but they would build it in a new way so rather than using a new concept uh, that would hold the bridge up they would use a new concept during construction only they would support it from the top until it could support itself the argument was that this would not obstruct river tra uh, straight traffic but it still had the objection that it did reduce headway toward the shore. So this was not accepted. The railroad had no alternative but to seek still another design. And the design that was proposed was proposed by the engineer Robert Stevenson in about the early 1840s. There happened to be a rock in the middle of this waterway known as Britannia Rock. So to build something on that rock would not be to obstruct river tra straight traffic about 500 feet on each side of this rock was the shore. So Stevenson argued he could build supports on the shore and on the rock and only have to span about 500 feet between them. Well, how would he do that? Well, he argued he would build very large tubes of wrought iron that would span between these piers about 100 feet above the water providing plenty of room for the ships to pass underneath and also they would be large enough these tubes so that the railroad train could actually pass through the tube. This was a truly novel concept in the 1840s. It enabled uh, the trains to get across the, the, the straight and it enabled the, um, uh, the straight traffic to continue unimpeded. The tubes would be made out of sections of wrought iron using millions of rivets this was the biggest construction project going on in Britain at the time. Stevenson said, however, that he had to know how many rivets to put in, how thick to make the tubes, what shape to make the tubes, and so forth and so on. Because it hadn't been done before, he recognized that the only way to assure success was to understand the failure mode. How would such a structure behave? He and his co colleagues made elaborate tests on example after example of tubing made of wrought iron. They tried different shapes, they tried different thicknesses, and they finally came up with a design that would be sufficiently strong. On the shore they could build this tube by making scaffolding because there was no waterway to obstruct here. But to make the tube between the towers that would span over the waterway, they first had to build it on the shore and then in an elaborate procedure float it into place. This was uh, really the event of the 1840s, the late 1840s. People came to watch this happening. Engineers visited the site. And this illustration shows one of the tubes already in place and one of the, uh, the second long tube being floated into place. The bridge was finally completed in 1850 and is shown here, known as the Britannia Bridge. It took its name after the rock in the middle of the strait. Now it's a very unusual bridge and the story explains how it came to be. It came to be because other types of bridge simply didn't work. 
It has some very unusual features. The towers are exceptionally tall, you'll notice. They seem to serve no function. Well, the reason they were made tall is that because in the early stages of the design of this bridge, there were those who anticipated that one of the ways it would be able to, to fail would be for the tubes to, to sag under their own weight, much as the uh, marble column of Galileo or the, the obelisks would break under their own weight. There was some concern that these tubes might be so heavy that they might not be able to support their own weight. Even though elaborate tests have been done on, on models on smaller scale structures, Again, because of the, the uh, recognition that there was this effect that Galileo pointed out centuries earlier, they knew that the structure itself, the full-scale bridge, might hold some surprises. So they took the precaution of being able to string chains between the towers and to support the tubes if necessary. Well, it proved that they were not necessary. So structurally, the bridge was a tremendous success. It was as strong as anyone could desire for this, the, the heavy railroad locomotives to pass through. But interestingly, we don't see many bridges like this. And it's reasonable to ask why. Why something that was, took so much effort to develop? Why something that worked so well structurally, that was so strong and substantial, seems not to have lasted? Well, the reason was that in paying so much attention to making the bridge strong, to making it structurally sound, by looking at the very narrow technical objective of getting the railroad trains across the strait, Stevenson and his colleagues overlooked some other aspects of design. And all engineering designs involve many, many uh, facets. For example, they didn't anticipate, apparently, that this was, in effect, a tunnel in the sky of a length of perhaps 1,500 feet from portal to portal. They didn't anticipate that it would get very hot there in the midday sun. Reports of 120 degrees Fahrenheit were not uncommon. This made it very uncomfortable to ride through. Well, one might have been able to endure that for the short distance, but in addition, the trains of the time, of course, burned wood, which made smoke and soot, and made it a very, very uninviting environment. And we might say then that the environmental failure was not anticipated. Environmental considerations were ignored. A bridge must not only uh, be a success from a structural point of view, but it should really also work to the comfort of those using it. Another way in which this bridge failed was that it turned out to be extremely expensive because it used so much wrought iron, it was so heavy, and it, it used so much labor because it had so many millions of rivets. So within five or ten years of this bridge's completion in 1850, different bridges were being built. What kinds of bridges? Well, bridges that had to solve the same problem. They had to cross waterways. They had to span of the order of 500 feet. They had to be high so that they didn't obstruct the, the uh, boat traffic. And the kinds of bridges that people designed were bridges like this, the Saltash Bridge, designed by Isambard King de Brunel in the 1850s. Here it is during, construct, during, during erection. These tubes, which were hollow, uh, so the trains could drive through them, but were also open to the sides and to the air, so that there wouldn't be this environmental problem. Not only would there not be an environmental problem, but they used a lot less material and therefore were lighter and less expensive. So this was a much more economical bridge to build. This bridge also still stands today. And it's considered uh, one of you know, Britain's uh, treasures of, of, of engineering. Now, in profile, this bridge looks very slender compared to Stevenson's tubular bridge, and in fact it was. Now, what happens in the evolution of, of engineering structures, like bridges here, is as these designs succeed, there is an increasing pressure by those who pay for bridges, in this case the railroad companies, to make the bridges lighter and lighter, and therefore less and less expensive to build. Well, the engineers typically will resist this, except over time, the engineers and the designers believe that they understand how the bridges work better. Whereas Stevenson had to do tests to design his uh, wrought iron tubes, when we get into the 1860s and the 1870s, engineers are beginning to think 
that they understand the principles of the behavior of the bridges better. They believe they understand how the forces work. They believe that they understand so well that they can predict much more finely how the bridge might fail. As a result, they tend to build lighter and lighter and lighter bridges until the bridges become so light that they can be blown off their piers, such as the Tay Bridge was in 1879. Only about 30 years after the very successful Britannia Tubular Bridge, and this is a direct descendant of that. So within 30 years, uh, the great structural success leads to a colossal structural failure. Now why? Well, in this case, we can analyze it partly and, and, and see what happened. And it's not unlike what Galileo was writing about. The heavier bridges, being so heavy, were not able to be blown off their supports. It's like putting a brick on a table and trying to, to blow it off. It's, it's, it's virtually impossible. But as the bridges got lighter and lighter, then the force of the wind against them became more and more significant. Whereas it had been insignificant in the heavier bridges, it becomes a dominant factor in some cases in the lighter bridges. And in designing this bridge, it was not thought necessary to tie it down because bridges just weren't blown over in the wind. Well, after this one was, of course, people thought, thought differently. This illustration shows how this Tay Bridge looked before it was blown down, and the high girders in the distance were the ones that were blown uh, away. The bottom illustration shows how the Tay Bridge was reconstructed, just beside the one that blew down. And what you can see is, is also a typical reaction to failure in engineering, and really to failure in, in all walks of life, an overcompensation for the embarrassment. This new bridge is much heavier, and its piers are much heavier, and generally it gives a much more substantial feeling to the person who is asked to go over it. <laughs> now what happens in the wake of, of accidents like this? Well, this style of bridge then starts falling a little bit out of fashion. The other bridge that was to be built on the same railroad line up in Scotland over the Firth of uh, uh, Forth was going to be different. They were not going to build a bridge like the, uh, the Tay Bridge. They were going to build a new type of bridge, a new concept. And because it was such a new concept, the designer made this anthropomorphic model of how the bridge was going to work. This was in the late 1880s. At that time, there was a much more general interest among the, the public in how structures work, in how engineering principles were applied to everyday problems. And this illustration shows how the bridge was going to work. The illustration of the design of the bridges across the top, and these two gentlemen are sitting on chairs. They are holding pieces of, of wood in their hands that are being pushed into the chair, and their hands keep those pieces of wood from being pulled out. They uh, hold in each of their hands a little platform on which this middleman is sitting. And that would be a suspended part of this bridge that would be supported from what would be effectively cantilevered arms, much like the problem that Galileo discussed. By the end of the, the 19th century, this, the principles behind this were understood quite well. And it was felt that this kind of bridge could definitely be built to span of the order of 1,500 feet. It was built and completed in 1890 to carry the railroad train across the Firth of Fort. Here it's shown and it's considered one of uh, the, the most famous bridges in Scotland. It also still stands today. It celebrated its uh, centennial last year and virtually the only thing that has been found to be wrong with it in the hundred years is that there's been a little bit of corrosion due to some chemical interaction with the exhaust gases of the railroad trains. But structurally, it's in perfect shape. Notice that it sort of spreads out its legs against the wind. Its structural shape is in reaction to the failure that occurred in the Tay Bridge only a decade earlier. So here is a new kind of bridge in the 1880s, say 1890, it's completed. What happens in the wake of this new success? Well, a lot of people, although this bridge was so successful, criticized it as being overly designed. 
They said it was actually too heavy. It's actually only carrying, you know, railroad trains. And look how massive it is. What people started doing is building lighter bridges of the same kind. Here's a cantilever bridge, obviously. You see it's supported on one end. It's reaching out. It's just like Galileo's problem. But in contrast to the Firth of Forth bridge, this one is clearly much lighter. Much lighter looking, much more susceptible to things going wrong. Well, if you can anticipate those things going wrong, then there's no problem. You've built a light bridge that will withstand the elements, withstand the forces it, it's subjected to. But it turns out that in this bridge, there was a hidden way in which it could fail that the engineers hadn't anticipated. They hadn't anticipated it because earlier robust bridges of this kind had shown no signs of distress. But when you make the members more and more slender, they can give way in new ways. And in fact, what happened to this bridge shortly after this photograph was taken in about 1909 was that it collapsed before it could even be completed. It couldn't support its own weight. It's like an obelisk. It's like a fallen column. It's like a ship that was too large for its own weight. Well, this bridge was redesigned and rebuilt. It's now known as the Quebec Bridge across the St. Lawrence. And uh, this illustration shows it to be slightly different than what we were looking at. <clears throat> this illustration shows it to be much heavier than the original design. And this is, again, the reaction to, to the failure. But this is also, today, <clears throat> a symbol of Canada. The Canadians are very proud of this bridge. They do remember the history, the embarrassing history of its construction. But it's been standing since 1917. It's a gateway to Canada when one approaches from the St. Lawrence River. And also it has the distinction of being one of the longest bridges of this type in the world. Because people generally didn't want to pay to build bridges like this after the embarrassing experience with this one. Even though the principles were understood, there was something about this design that steered them away from it. Well, this is typical. It takes a long time to, to design, raise the financing, and build a bridge of the order of a decade or more. And those that were being built like it at the time were completed, but that was about it. So again, the, the, the design reaches an evolutionary dead end, more or less. Well, what I've just been describing is more or less the British tradition of bridge building. And we see what really has, has happened is that the, the, the fact that bridges fail to meet certain requirements, whether it's carrying a railroad train or, more substantially, standing up under one, uh, causes new designs to be proposed and to be built. If you recall, this all started with the Menai Straits suspension bridge, Telford's Bridge. Its problems were that it was simply too light. The railroad trains caused it to deflect too much, and this was undesirable. The wind caused its deck to be blown down now and then, and this was undesirable. So the British said, well, this kind of bridge doesn't work for railroad trains. We have to look toward these other designs, and they did. But there's not just one way to solve an engineering problem. And although the British eschewed the suspension bridge design, the Americans took it up in a different manner. The Americans, in particular John Roebling, didn't just say, I can't design suspension bridges. He said, I'm going to figure out why it is we can't design suspension bridges and design a successful one. He said, I can design a successful suspension bridge if I understand why they're being blown down, why their decks are being destroyed in the wind. He wrote a paper in the 1840s and talked about a lot of failures of suspension bridges. Famous ones such as the Brighton Chain Pier here that was destroyed in the late 1830s. He described the troubles with the Menai Bridge. And he described a lot of other bridge failures, suspension bridge failures. He actually apologized toward the end of this paper for discussing so many bad things about engineering. But he argued that it's only by talking about the problems that I know how to achieve the successes. He was quite explicitly aware that it was by understanding all the ways in which something can fail 
that you design a successful structure. He read literature that showed him and ex that, that theorized how suspension bridges were failing. This is a paper written in the 1840s. It theorized that what was bringing down the decks of these suspension bridges was that they were vibrating in the wind. And this author theorized that if you tied down the deck and suppressed those vibrations, then it should be able to withstand even gale force winds. Well, Roebling took all this in, uh, to account and by 1854 was able to complete this bridge over the Niagara Gorge between New York and Canada. This bridge is known as the Niagara Suspension Bridge. It spans about 800 feet between the towers and you notice that there's a railroad train riding along the top of it. Well, this single example of Roebling's bridge here disproved the British hypothesis that it couldn't be done. Here's proof that it can be done. And how Roebling did it was by looking at how the other bridges had failed. The Manai Bridge had failed because it was too weak. The deck deflected too much as the train went over. That meant when the train got to the middle like this, it would be almost down in a valley and had to climb up out of it. A very difficult task for a, 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 a locomotive in those days. Well, what Roebling did to uh, remove that difficulty is he made this a double deck bridge. He made it deep. He made it a deep girder, much like Stevenson's uh, wrought iron girder. And by doing this, he stiffened it. And you can see from this uh, illustration that the bridge is withstanding the weight of the train quite well. Roebling's measurements on this bridge showed it to deflect only two or three inches under several locomotives loaded on it at once. Here's a contemporary photograph of the bridge showing in more detail how the uh, double decking worked. It also shows a little bit uh, the, some of the fine wires that run down from it to steady it against the wind. He understood that to make the bridge successful, he had to anticipate what could be its downfall. And this is the role of failure in successful design that I constantly allude to. To give further evidence that this was, was not just, this is not just wishful thinking, uh, Roebling was very conscious of the idea of anticipating failure. This is his Brooklyn Bridge under construction. By this time, John Roebling had actually died in a construction accident, but his son, Washington Roebling, had taken over. The construction of the bridge required that a catwalk be set up first, really a small-scale suspension bridge. And this illustration has a sign in the center that effectively tells these people inspecting the bridge, don't walk in step, don't run or jump. Be careful because you can set the bridge into vibration, the way cattle had been known to trample across bridges and bring them down, or the way soldiers marching across bridges had been known to cause the bridge to vibrate in resonance with their march step. And this shows clearly that the Roeblings, father and son, knew that they had to make sure that the problem didn't exist. They had to anticipate the failure and eliminate it, either by telling the people not to cause the problem or by tying down the bridge because you can't tell the wind not to blow. The Brooklyn Bridge went on to be completed in 1883 and it too recently celebrated its centennial. At the time it was the longest suspension bridge in the world, close to 1500 feet. <clears throat> In the wake of the Brooklyn Bridge, a lot of suspension bridges were built, especially in America. It was the design of choice. Although it had an early difficult history, Roebling's experience in designing the Niagara Bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge, and many, many others encouraged engineers well into the 20th century to use this for long spans across waterways. Here's the George Washington Bridge, <clears throat> designed in the 20s, completed in the early 1930s about twice as long or more than the Brooklyn Bridge. Within a half century, the scale, the size had doubled. But more importantly, what makes this bridge different is that some of Roebling's precautions had become relaxed. The deck is much, much slenderer, much lighter, relatively speaking, than Roebling's bridges. Also, the diagonal stays that were characteristic of Roebling's bridges to suppress vibrations were not included in bridges like this. Well, the George Washington Bridge never had any problems, still doesn't have any problems. It is so heavy, it's so wide to carry six, seven, eight lanes of traffic on its deck 
that the, mere, the sheer weight of the deck kept it in place. But other bridges were being built at the time were less uh, stiff. The Golden Gate Bridge, for example, built to the same state of the art, completed in what, 1937, a distance of about 4,200 feet between the towers. <clears throat> it's shown here um, in uh, uh, a recent, recent photograph. In <clears throat> 1987, the Golden Gate Bridge supported, uh, re, um, celebrated its 50th anniversary. And as a way of celebrating that anniversary, people were allowed to walk across the bridge. Traffic was banned from it for a morning. Well, they didn't anticipate that as many people as this were going to show up. It turned out that at one time, there were a quarter of a million people on the bridge. The whole day of the opening ceremony, only 200,000 walked across from morning to night. So what happened in 1987 was that the Golden Gate Bridge experienced the heaviest load it had ever experienced in its lifetime. And it turned out that it showed it. The reports are that it deflected 10 feet at center span. It swayed from side to side several feet. Fortunately, the people didn't panic. They were enjoying it. It was a beautiful day. <laughs> but the engineers watching this were doing some quick calculations. <laughs> some of the reports say that some of the cables that were suspending the roadway actually became slack. Well, that meant that they weren't supporting their portion of the load. That meant that some of the other suspenders were actually doing more than they were expected to do. In other words, this was a dangerously high load for this bridge. Unanticipated because, really, who thinks that people walking across a bridge are going to create more trouble than traffic on it, stuck bumper to bumper? Well, it turns out that people actually do create a denser load because not only are they on the, the roadway, but they're on every square inch of the roadway and also on the sidewalks. So it does turn out to be really the real test of the bridge. Fortunately, the Golden Gate Bridge survived, as we know. But I'm sure when it reaches its 100th anniversary that it won't be open to pedestrians. <laughs> now. What has been happening here, of course, is that we've seen since the Brooklyn Bridge, the robust Brooklyn Bridge, bridges got longer and longer, but they also got lighter and lighter. That's why this Golden Gate deflected so much. It's simply not as stiff. It's not as stiff because it was built to be a lighter bridge, a more economical bridge. It was built in the Depression, and its engineer wanted to build it in the worst way, but he had to make sure that the money that could be raised would be sufficient to pay for the bridge, which meant that it had to be built without too much reserve strength. Now, that's not necessarily irresponsible, of course. And as we see with the Golden Gate, although it's flexible, it's not unsafe. Other bridges that were built in the same tradition, however, included the Tacoma Narrow. State of the art, meaning that the same understanding of the theory of suspension bridges was used to design it as it was used to design the Golden Gate. Now, as everybody knows, the Tacoma Narrows behaved differently. As soon as it was completed, it started undulating. Within three months, it was doing this twisting motion. Now, why did this behave differently than the Golden Gate and these other? It behaved differently because it was some minor details, some minor modifications that had been made, much as Galileo's column support. One of the things was that whereas the Golden Gate, the George Washington and other bridges had a very, very deep structure under the deck, a very open truss work, this bridge had solid girders. And you can see that's why it looks different. The girders were only about eight feet deep. But the bridge is spanning almost 3,000 feet. This made for a very, very, very slender bridge. And you all know how easy it is to bend a slender ruler as opposed to, say, a thick 2 by 4 Well, the same principles apply. Furthermore, because this was an area of low traffic demand, this didn't have to have six, eight decks across, which give additional weight and stiffness to the bridge. It only needed two decks, uh, two uh, lanes of traffic, one each way. 
As a result, this was a very, very flexible bridge, not only in bending, but also in torsion or twisting, as shown here. And we all know the story of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It eventually twisted itself to such an extent, and here shown in one of its extreme motions, the roadway virtually impossible to pass. And eventually, of course, it tore itself apart in 1940. 50, 60 years after the Brooklyn Bridge's success, 10 years after the George Washington Bridge success, this had happened. Well, again, it's in the same tradition as, as I've outlined. The successful structure leads to the desire to make more economical successful structures. But people tend to forget, and engineers are people, engineers are human too. They tend to forget that people like John Roebling took a special care to identify all the different ways in which suspension bridges could fail. He read the things published in 1830 and 1840. Well, a century later, engineers had thought that that was irrelevant. They weren't reading what was published in, in 1830 and 1840. They may have known that bridges failed back then, but they certainly didn't think that what they could read about them was relevant, or so it seems. Because nobody was talking about those things before the Tacoma Narrows Bridge failed. But within weeks of its failure, there were all sorts of articles in all sorts of magazines about the history of suspension bridges. Hmm. Well, what this all suggests, of course, is that there is more relevance to history than might at first appear. Just to show that this theme of reacting to failure occurs time and time again. This is what? Well, the rebuilt Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Notice that it doesn't look so slender. Suddenly aesthetics became less important. Now, this example and the others I've shown, I think show a clear, really we could say a cycle in the behavior of large engineering structures like bridges. It shows that the greatest successes follow the most careful attention to failure, either by careful analysis and anticipation, because the engineer knows he's doing something truly novel, or because it's in reaction to a failure occurring, an actual failure. We've also seen that when successes start developing over a period of time, there appears to be a certain complacency of a kind that leads to lighter and lighter structures that become, at one point, a little bit too light. Now, is this inevitable? Is this a cycle that would never seem to be breakable? Well, I would think not. I would think that uh, by being aware of the history of suspension bridges and the other kinds of bridges that I've described tonight, that engineers can recognize that they have to think about more than just the immediate state of the art. They have to look into more than just their latest textbooks. They have to be willing to look at the history of the genre in which they're de designing. They have to respect that there are going to be surprises as things are scaled up. Galileo knew this, and there's no reason why we shouldn't know it 350 years later. There's no reason why our students shouldn't know it. It seems clear that the best way to teach this is by example, by the examples of history, by outlines such as I've, I've given tonight. So I'm not pessimistic. I'm optimistic that this can be done, but it takes a rethinking of, of engineering education. It takes a thinking that does incorporate things outside of just the narrow technical discipline. We have to take the history of the discipline seriously. Thank you. Uh, we have questions now. There's um, a mic there, and there's a mic on the other aisle, and there's one up there, and we'll kind of rotate. And if some of you down here just want to raise your hand, I think we can do that too. But I'll let uh, you can go ahead and take it. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, I have some uncles who live up in Mercer Island, and they like to sit around and make jokes about the floating bridge sinking. Um, and they attribute the uh, sinking to kind of a dispersed sense of responsibility and supervisors of supervisors, but nobody with a overall picture. So they just went home and left the corks off and the thing filled up and sank. And then I think of the shuttle, of course, space shuttle, and and the organizational issues that came up with that and in the post-mortem of that. And then I think about, talk about the Wall Street, uh, the effects of computers selling off automatically and how that exacerbates all the swinging of the stock market. And my point in bringing these three together is it seems as we move into an information management kind of super complex engineering uh, challenges that the human organizations that support the process of design and implementation are increasingly the source of failure. And I'm wondering to what extent your analysis leaves the structure of materials and the geometry of the actual bridge and moves back to the structure of the organizations that implement these designs. And whether you think that with information technology, which focuses so much on invisibility uh, of information, that you can't really point to the structure sometimes. But is engineering really still what we need to be learning? Well, obviously, I think we still need to keep learning engineering because these are there are some severe technical problems that have to be faced in, in all of these applications that uh, I described and that, that you've just outlined. I will say that uh, many of the examples you've you've given, the the Mercer Island Bridge up in uh, up by the Tacoma Narrows, uh, the uh, space shuttle, and uh, the computer problems, uh, really are extensions of what I've been discussing. They they involve these failures of complacency. Uh, the uh, corks were left out of the bridge, as you uh, indicate, uh, because the, that bridge had had worked so well for so long that uh, people didn't dream that it would, would fail. Uh, the, the workmen certainly didn't uh, when, they, when they left the doors open. The space shuttle, I think, is also an excellent example. As we know, there were about 24 successful um, space shuttle launchings before Challenger failed. Uh, the fact that there were so many successes, again, led to a complacency. It was believed that the space shuttle was much more robust than it was. The, um, Engineers argued the night before the fatal launch that there were some troubles with the O-rings. They argued that the, the O-rings could produce leaks, especially in the cold weather that was predicted for the next morning. Well, of course, the reason they knew about these potential leaks is because they had had some troubles on previous flights. But the uh, other side of the argument was, and this is how the managers uh, proceeded uh, in part, was, well, you know, these other shuttles did fly with uh, faulty O-rings and they didn't have any trouble. So that we are not uh, necessarily uh, doomed to failure with this. We'll worry about the, the O-rings eventually, but not tonight. Well, the reason in part that they didn't want to worry about it that night was uh, what typically complicates engineering problems and uh, what typically uh, is behind the scenes in a lot of failures too, and that is the, the, the non-technical aspects of engineering, perhaps uh, what you would, would call the, the, the information transfer. The uh, managers were very much aware that it would not help NASA's image to postpone the flight, and they were also aware that the next uh, evening, I believe it was, the uh, president was scheduled to give a State of the Union, the Union address. And uh, it was uh, understood that the president wanted uh, badly to have a live hookup with uh, the uh, teacher on board, Krista McAuliffe. And uh, to postpone the shuttle launch, because some engineers were getting cold feet because of some funny O-rings, uh, was something the, the managers simply didn't want to take responsibility for. Uh, the person that uh, went and uh, described much of the uh, situation the night before the launch has uh, pretty much been ostracized by the uh, aerospace community, uh, and he's been labeled a whistleblower. Uh, so so these, are, these are difficult problems. I've discussed tonight in, in my examples largely situations that were a little cleaner, but a lot of the more complicated issues uh, that uh, are, are involved, uh, like the space shuttle, involve politics and, uh, 
and, and other aspects. The computer is also a, a growing concern of, of a lot of people. Uh, it's clear that a lot of the telephone disruptions have been due to uh, problems with computer software. It's very interesting that uh, one of the most recent uh, apparently involved just some minor changes in the computer codes that are used to uh, uh, monitor the switching devices and, and make sure they're operating properly. It turns out that because there were such minor changes made in the software, that the company that sold the software to the telephone company apparently did not put it through what it was, was customary to do, namely about 13 weeks of testing, to see what might be uncovered. Well, really, what the purpose of testing like that is for is to uncover ways in which it can fail, ways in which it can surprise the designer, possible ways in which the designer hadn't anticipated that failure could occur. It's generally good practice. In the tradition of the bridges that I've described, it used to be quite the case that virtually every bridge was proof tested. And what this meant was that you drove an engine across the bridge and watched how it behaved. If it behaved fine, you drove another engine and another engine until you were satisfied that the bridge could take as many engines as it would ever experience in its lifetime. You didn't wait for the 50th anniversary when pedestrians went on the bridge to test it. You tested it before you gave it over to the person that paid the money. And typically, this is, is the way to, to catch accidents, uh, potential <coughs> disastrous accidents. The Hyatt Regency uh, walkways that failed in 1981 were a particularly you know, tragic thing. Uh, 114 people were killed, a lot more injured. It's the greatest structural accident that's ever occurred in this country. Now, the walkways were like bridges very much. They were, in fact, suspended from the ceiling. Had the persons or persons or organization buying those walkways as part of the Hyatt Regency Hotel demanded that they be proof tested, demanded that they be shown to be safe before the contract was closed, then that accident probably never would have happened because it was so clearly a defective design change that uh, introduced the, the weak link that loading a bunch of sandbags on those walkways would have caused them to collapse and no lives needed to have been lost. So I'm a strong advocate of, of reintroducing a, a high level of consciousness that you recognize in the spirit of Galileo, in the spirit of the other kinds of engineers like Roebling that I've mentioned, that you can, you can not be surprised as much as you are if you allow for the fact that you're not perfect and there might be something you're missing. To prove that you're not missing that, you proof test the structure or the software or whatever it is that you're, you're designing. Now, I guess this involves information transfer. To me, the greatest information transfer is the, the, the lessons of history, because I think they give us a perspective. The um, software uh, engineers are becoming especially concerned these days that increasing numbers of failures are happening. Not only the uh, telephone incident, but, but other incidents. What they're beginning to do is to invite people who talk about bridges and engines and sort of mundane things that have been around for a long time to talk about the history of these things and their failures because the people in the software industry are recognizing that their biggest disadvantage at this point is that they have a very very shallow historical perspective on what can go wrong and what can surprise them in the balcony up here uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, about that introduces another factor into the discussion. It seems that the art of engineering uh, asks or addresses the issue of the confrontation between maybe human ingenuity and natural limits. And in the case of bridges, you talked about the spans across rivers and confronting gravitational force and engineers coming, overcoming those natural forces. In the Northwest, the greatest engineering projects are hydroelectric dams. And we have asked that those dams span great rivers and also produce hydroelectric power. My question is to introduce a third factor when you talk about environmental failure. 
would it have been possible to ask the engineers in the 1930s to develop a dam that spanned the Columbia River, produced electric power, and allowed for the passage of biological organisms? In other words, a third environmental factor. And the question expands to uh, whether we should ask engineers to address the ultimate environmental question of our impact on the human, uh, the, the impact of humans on the natural environment, and whether we are asking enough of engineers not only to overcome the force of gravity, but also to overcome the biological limitations of other organisms. What do you think? <laughs> uh, uh, first, let me say I've been asked to, I've been asked to repeat the questions, but I'm assuming everybody can hear them because they are rather longish and I'm not sure I can and, and repeat them verbatim. Is there any trouble in hearing the questions? No. I think your, your question is well taken. You're, you're basically uh, asking if engineers can be asked to take into account these, these uh, considerable environmental concerns. And the answer, the, the short answer is yes, they certainly can. Uh, why aren't they? Well, I think again we're, we are getting into the, the realm of, of politics and economics and, and influence and so forth. Uh, this is where technological literacy is so important. Uh, it's, it's not only important for engineers to recognize responsibilities, but it's also important for non-engineers to recognize their responsibilities. And uh, when a contract is signed for a new dam, the specifications uh, may or may not include the care of biological species, for example, but they certainly can. And it's certainly fair to ask the engineer to take that into account. I have absolutely no, no problem with that. Uh, it, it seems elementary to me. I will say that uh, there is uh, hope for the future if uh, that is, is part of your question. The uh, engineering students that we see today, by and large, are choosing engineering because they see a potential way of helping with environmental concerns. In, in the broadest sense. Uh, they say engineer, see engineering as a way of, of enabling them to, to technically do things that are, are going to satisfy the kinds of objectives that you've, uh, you've spoken about. Uh, the tradition of engineering is not without concern for such things. Uh, one of the earliest formal defini definitions of engineering was written in the 1820s uh, when the institution of civil engineers was formed in England. And, uh, among one of its most memorable phrases was that uh, whatever the engineer does, he does for the benefit of mankind in the broadest sense. Now that includes commerce, that includes uh, technical uh, issues of getting railroad trains across waterways, but it also includes everything that might, be, might come under the rubric of the benefit of mankind. The latest definitions of engineering that come down from that tradition still include phrases that are remarkably close to that. And the definition of civil engineering, uh, uh, for example, that is uh, given by the American Society of Civil Engineers, not only includes terms like that, but also includes words like environment and responsibility and ethics and values. So there, there is an awareness among the engineering community. Uh, that's not to say that every engineer, an individual engineer, is as sensitive to these issues as, as the other. But when I spoke tonight about success and failure in terms of bridges and, and rather hard te technical details, I hope it's clear that I'm speaking metaphorically. And uh, I think uh, it's perfectly clear that uh, if you're asked to design a dam that will allow uh, the kind of passage that you described and it uh, is not done successfully, then it's indeed it's, it's as much a failure as a bridge falling down. Dr. Petrosky, there are people who are working on the uh, mechanics of downloading human consciousness into machines. Um, they seem to think it's only a matter of time before they succeed, and maybe within this generation or the next. I was wondering what you think the possibility they'll succeed, um, and what you think of the ethics of the endeavor. Well, I don't personally think they're going to succeed to any great extent, and so to me then the ethics become a moot point almost. Uh, the uh, reason I don't believe it is that engineering uh, has a large non-rational component to it in the sense that 
the kinds of designs that I've been talking about tonight and other designs that engineers deal with come first from a source that is almost inexplicable. How did Stevenson get his idea for the tubular bridge? How did uh, Roblin get uh, the idea to look at suspension bridges in his new way? Nobody, nobody knows this kind of thing. Engineering is not applied science, and there is, uh, there is no way that it ever will be. There is no way that it can be put into an algorithm, in my opinion. I don't think that I hear the, the artistic community seriously expecting computers to be downloaded with artistic genius to compose symphonies, really. So I don't think that uh, it's really reasonable to ever expect them to, uh, to computers to ever be able to design the kinds of things that, uh, that I've been talking about tonight. Computers can do what has been done, and they can do it in routine ways. But to expect them to reach out in new directions and anticipate every possible way in which failure can occur, I don't think is, 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 is reasonable. Because ultimately, the thing comes down to programming experience. And as I've shown, humans can't do this. I doubt that anyone could program into a computer every conceivable contingency. This is why I advocate the proof test. This is why a lot of engineers advocate the proof test. You don't say that, okay, I've made this design and it's ready to go and uh, I'm not going to look at it again. I'm not going to test it. The, 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 the smart engineer will test it. I think to expect to put all of this, or to download it as you, you put it into a computer program is, to me, just inconceivable. It, it, uh, it's a personal prejudice, if, if you will, but it's uh, a prejudice that I support with the, the, uh, the reading I've done in the history of engineering, and, and seeing how uh, complex the human involvement in engineering really is. Could you take another balcony question? Sure. Um, you were speaking on the history and the trial and error. How do you feel that errors such as the Chernobyl disaster have an effect on what lesson does it teach us? Well, I know less about the Chernobyl disaster than I do about a lot of the other things we've talked about, but uh, uh, my expectation is that the, the Chernobyl uh, disaster uh, uh, seems to be more, seems to have been more like the Three Mile Island disaster and things like that in that they involved uh, very complex systems and very complex organizations uh, with competing uh, objectives. I really can't speak uh, directly to the Chernobyl disaster very, very uh, intelligently, I'm afraid. Uh, I, I would assume and I feel with some confidence that if, if I were to look at it carefully it would uh, fall into the same category of uh, a rather over confidence. The uh, Three Mile Island uh, uh, accident, for example, which I do know more details about, uh, to me occurred in a, climates, a climate, again, of complacency. The, uh, there had been nuclear reactor power plants uh, operating for, for some years, uh, well, really for decades, and uh, they had, by and large, been uh, trouble-free. There had been some incidents, but they were not terribly severe incidents in that uh, there were not great releases of radiation. There were some uh, problems with fires in plants, and, and even in, in those cases, the plants seem to have proven fairly robust. So I think when uh, the Three Mile Island accident happened, it was in a climate, again, of, of, uh, of, of robustness. People had become, well, the people that worked closely with these things, at least, they were sort of ho-ho-hum things to them, um, just, just like the, the Challenger incident that I, that I described. As I recall, when the Three Mile Island accident happened, there was, uh, it was sort of a real time, uh, it, it evolved in real time over the, televi over the television, and uh, it seemed, that, as I recall, that almost hourly the explanation was changing as to what was uh, happening and what was, what was going wrong, which suggested to me a lot of confusion at the time. Uh, I, I, I don't know much more about it than, than that. Yes, sir. Well, you've been talking about what might be called failure mode within the application, and one of the earlier speakers raised questions about the impact of the application uh, on a larger environment. And this is something that has interested me a great deal in the last couple of years, trying to work it out as kind of a systems theorist. Uh, what I 
one way of thinking about engineering and technology generally is that it is a amplifier of human initiatives. Uh, to use a crude term they used quite a few years ago when the atom bomb first came out, more bang for a buck or more results for a certain amount of somebody, you know, deciding to do something. The problem that occurs to me about all of this is that in general, the more powerful a technology is designed to produce some major effect, whatever that may be, the further the effects of applying that technology spread throughout all kinds of related systems. Now, what you've been talking about this evening has to do largely with, again, failures within the technology where relationships are comparatively well known. The problem is that when the effects of the technology, when a, when a technology grows very powerful, the effects spread further and further into areas where the relationships are not so well known, uh, where the number of variables is very, very large, where all the kinds of problems that enter into chaos theory of cumulative error in attempts to predict and calculate and so forth and so on all enter into the situation. And I have begun to wonder myself whether it is even possible in a certain sense to make rational public policy decisions about the applications of extremely powerful technologies. Because literally, there does not exist the means even for the most well-intentioned people to predict what the consequences will be. That's the question, is, is there, how do you as an engineer see us trying to come to grips with that kind of a problem which increasingly is producing the so-called unexpected consequence on a large scale, like the uh, hole in the ozone layer or the uh, uh, greenhouse effect or whatever? Well, I certainly agree that, that what you, you've outlined uh, present much more complex problems than what I've indicated. But again, I, I'm interested in communicating something that uh, is, is, is sort of graspable in, in maybe an hour. And so I stuck to, to one you know, narrow focus. But that's not to say that I, I don't believe these ideas go beyond the, the literal meaning that I've given them. I believe, for example, that uh, it's very important to anticipate the consequences of technology. I would say that that's part of the design problem without question. If it's not being done, I would say, if it's not being done as well as, as we would like, I would say that what we should be doing is calling attention to that fact, but calling attention to it convincingly, not just stating it, but giving evidence after evidence after evidence, which to me basically means giving the historical evidence, giving case studies that are clear and articulate and make the point rather concisely, showing, you know, pointing out the horror stories, driving home the point that chances are these horror stories are going to be repeated again and again and again unless we think more carefully. Now that's obviously easier said than done. But what can we learn? Well, maybe there can be proof tests built into more complex systems, for example. Maybe a, a more complex system should be introduced more carefully. I mean, when, when a, a, a manufacturer introduces a new product, he generally test markets it. Maybe we should think about test marketing, so to speak, newer complex technologies, so that we can discover whether they're going to work or not. And, and maybe they'll give some early hints about what could go wrong. I fully agree with you. Uh, I don't deny that these are complex issues. I, I would think, though, that the way to solve complex problems is to back off and look at simpler problems, look at how simpler problems are approached, and then extend by analogy slowly into the more complex arena. From the top, up in the balcony. Uh, down here, please. I've been waiting. Okay. Uh, yeah, they have been waiting a long time. Here. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Petrosky, to what extent do you think engineers uh, should try to educate the public about relative risk versus simply going along with what our priorities have been and engineering for those? In the, uh, the lecture um, program, you mentioned the, the fact that some people are still afraid of airplane uh, travel while they take a huge risk in driving their car. And I'd like to hear your opinions, opinions on that, which are especially relative now 
um, when we talk about environmental exposure, for instance, as a risk in, in society? Well, I would say that, that engineers have a responsibility for educating the public about relative risk, as you put it, uh, just as, as much as the common citizen. Uh, the, the reporter, for example, or, or the journalist has the responsibility. Uh, these are more than technical matters. These are, these are matters of, of fact and, and occurrence. Uh, the problem that, that I, I have with relative risk in, in uh, solving it, if it's, if it's, if it's solvable, is that one of the reasons people would uh, do not perceive automobile travel to be as, as risky as it in fact is, is there is a preference factor. They simply prefer to, to control their own destinies by driving their own cars rather than uh, taking uh, an airplane where somebody else is, is flying it. They, they prefer the convenience. They, the, this is just uh, you know, part of their, their rights, so to speak, unless we as a, as a society choose that we are going to legislate that things will be highly prioritized according to their risks. Uh, I'm not prepared to, to comment much, much further on that other than to say that I see that as a much more uh, a broader responsibility than simply um, really an engineer's responsibility. Um, up here, yes, my question has to do with the concrete nature of engineering both in the metaphorical sense and in the very direct sense, which I gather is one of your specialties, uh, fractures in concrete. Um, opening tonight in Portland is a movie called Mind Walk, which deals with Fritov Capra's views in a very uh, romantic way about the contrast between the Cartesian view of reality, where the world is a mechanism and you break it down its component parts and they, the things are quite important, and a more modern view, uh, typified by the theories of subatomic physics, where the things are not so important as their relationships and how they interact. And engineering, to me, has, in many ways, been the epitome of the Cartesian view. You have a very straightforward, concrete view of the world, and you take these things, you do things with them. But as I hear you talk, I hear it more of a relationship view of the world of mankind and the material world. And I'd like to give an illustration. I happen to be born and raised in Durham, North Carolina, where you're working and living. And I know you'll be familiar with the concrete roads around Duke University. There are miles and miles of them, I presume they're still there. And there are cracks all over the roads. They've been filled with tar and over the roads. And the cracks are clearly a failure of someone's ability to build a road. But with the tar strips on them, the roads are drivable and somewhat interesting. It's the sounds they make over the strips. And I suggest that possibly the failure of a system is not so much in whether it met its original design as the relationship between the system and its eventual use. Could you comment? Yes, well, well I, I would tend to, to go so far as to say that failure uh, is, uh, can be defined in, in various ways. So I would, would allow that, uh, yes, we could say that, uh, you know, it's not just meeting the design requirements, but meeting the ultimate needs. That, uh, that would be a rather enlightened uh, way to, to approach certain matters. That would certainly eliminate a lot of litigation that we have today, for example. <laughs> uh, as far as uh, engineers, uh, you know, doing things uh, uh, more broadly, uh, feeling a, a broader uh, responsibility and an interaction with the cosmos, I guess, is what you're sort of saying. Uh, yes, I think engineers have always, uh, really, reflective engineers have always felt that they're doing more than just designing that bridge at that time. And I think, uh, again, I, I encourage you to read, read, read historical uh, uh, treatments of, of engineering. Read what some of the engineers wrote. Read the, the story of the, uh, the, the Britannia Tubular Bridge written by Robert Stevenson and his engineers. The, basically the report, the final report. It doesn't read like a dry final report that we tend to read today. It, it's, it's full of involvement with the whole of society. It's full of involvement uh, with, with how engineering uh, takes care of, of the needs of society and does, uh, does what it does for the benefit of mankind. The image of the engineer in, in Britain is, is quite different than it is in this country. There are, 
There are monuments to engineers all, all over the place. Uh, the layman knows who designed this, who designed that. And he knows what the implications of that design were, uh, not only for the, for the local economy, but for the larger picture of the country. There, there's, a, there's a pride taken in the fact that, that without the, the efforts of the, the great engineers of the 19th century, Britain simply would not have become what it did. Do you have a question? I have one more question up here. Okay, I, I can't see very well up, uh, in either microphone. So. Yes? A gentleman named Charles Perrault has written a really wonderful book called Normal Accidents, in which he analyzes various, various systems along the axes of complexity and coupling. And he concludes from his analysis that nuclear energy is simply too dangerous a technology to pursue, and he recommends that we abandon it. I was wondering if you agreed with him. Uh, I, I don't like to, to agree or disagree with individuals so, you know, um, so easily. Uh, I think uh, Perot's approach, as I understand it, is largely sociological, uh, or that's his, his, uh, his background. I have read his books and I've heard him speak, and I think he has a lot of valid points. Uh, whether the conclusion, uh, you know, is, is uh, right or not, I think involves many, many factors. I mean, would nuclear power plants uh, threaten the ozone layer the way uh, some other things do, for example? Should that be taken into account? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I'm not a nuclear advocate nor a nuclear opponent. Uh, uh, I haven't thought about the, the, the nuclear issue as uh, much as I've thought about so, some other things. Uh, I know the, the history of the nuclear power uh, industry in this country, and I, I, I know that the it really was begun under a lot of false pretenses, and I know that the government uh, had a very, very strong hand in, in introducing civilian nuclear power. Uh, I know a lot of that was was wrong, but uh, one of the uh, you know, as, as one of the earlier balcony questions referred to, if uh, it didn't, if something was wrong with it then and how it was introduced, uh, maybe we should look down the line. Maybe it's it's something that is not as bad now as it might have been perceived to have been. I don't really tend toward that, uh, that feeling, however. I know there are serious concerns with the, um, and, and, and unresolved problems with the waste disposal, with decommissioning plants, and so forth. Uh, I, I'm simply not a zealot about things like that, is, is all I can say. Question. Hmm. I'm an iron worker uh, who's just finished one of the bridges going up to uh, Mount St. Helens for the new observatory there. I'm wondering if you have any comments on the current state of the infrastructure uh, for the entire nation, the bridges and the roadways? Well, as I understand, there's been a lot of neglect of the infrastructure, uh, which basically means that uh, maintenance has not been done. Part of design, in designing a bridge, is, is also, uh, there's a very conscious decision usually made by engineers at the outset of a design, and that is, what is the lifetime of this structure supposed to be? And you design it accordingly. The reason the, the Firth of Forth Bridge, for example, lasted so well for a hundred years is that the maintenance procedures were, were laid out from the beginning and followed religiously. Uh, all structures, all engineering systems that are designed are designed to be maintained in a particular way. Now, down the line, 10, 20, 30 years, it sometimes is the choice of politicians and communities and others to forego scheduled maintenance because the money can be used for other things at the time. Well, that may be a choice that uh, you know, is made, and it's, of course, somebody's choice to make and their right to make it, but it violates the original intention of the design of the infrastructure. Uh, I think it's, it's an issue that really has to, be, has to be addressed. Getting back to nuclear power, for example, uh, I think it was wrong in the early days of the design of nuclear power plants not to look down the line as to how they would be decommissioned, not to look down the line as to how they uh, would handle the nuclear waste. That was a mistake. Whether uh, the, you know, it's uh, something that should be reversed or not, again, I'm not uh, interested in, in, in commenting on but, but I. I agree, the infrastructure is a serious, a serious problem that really should be addressed or we're going to be very, very sorry. Um, I'd like to ask a question more back towards the, um, the fundamental of what your uh, talk was about. 
that is that um, it seems that we keep going over this issue that failure in a way is what drives the successes, the analysis of the failure that um, without these attempts to drive it further and then a failure and then a looking back at that failure and evaluating it that we're not going to uh, gain any ground and you made a statement that maybe we can eliminate the failure and I, I, I'm wondering if maybe what we really need to do is have a way to mitigate it to encourage people to try something and to fail it in an issue that will not cause catastrophic failure I mean I'm a reason involved in the engineering studies and the thing is, is it seems in a way um, we reward so much the single answer, the single success, rather than investigating the process and saying, how can we test this and how can we really use failure to our advantage, not as a, uh oh, better build something different now. Can you comment that in education wise too? Well, if I understand the, the question, uh, basically a, a good design does take into account uh, the fact that something could, could go wrong and, and tries to uh, build in what is usually termed redundancy into the system or into the structure so that if, if uh, one thing breaks or, or, or goes wrong, there's something else to take up the slack, so to speak. And uh, there is a warning that, that the system is, is not behaving as it was originally intended. And there's an opportunity to get in and do some maintenance and do some, some repair work and, and bring the structure back up to its, to its original, original health, if, if, if you will. Um, this is uh, generally taught as good, good design practice. This is, this is nothing, uh, nothing new. Uh, the pressures, again, come in, and, and design doesn't take place on the drafting board solely. Design is a constant interaction among in, in engineers, um, uh, architects, planners, financial backers, politicians, uh, review boards, regulatory agencies and so forth and so on and all these people are pulling in different directions very often and there is often basically compromise it's not that the engineer necessarily uh, you know takes whatever is told to him and does that it's that uh, the engineer is uh, presumably a reasonable person as these other people are presumably reasonable persons and uh, you compromise you 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 try to uh, come out in the end with something that satisfies everybody. Now that often is uh, not the best of products, but unfortunately that's the system w under which we work. Is there somebody over there? Yes. Are you at all uncomfortable with the, uh, the role of engineers in litigation, or I should say the trend, trends in the role of engineers in litigation in society? I, I guess you're alluding to things like expert witnesses and, and so forth? Yes, that's correct. I don't have uh, very much direct evidence with that, but the, the anecdotal evidence I have and the, the few um, uh, things that I've been involved with tangentially uh, have not left a uh, particularly good taste in my mouth. Uh, so I guess you know, that answers your question. I, I'm not terribly uh, happy with the engineer as hired gun to you know, to uh, argue one way or the other, but uh, perhaps that's a little strong on the engineer. Actually, the, the, the trouble very often comes from, from the legal side where the lawyer will, will hunt for the engineer that will give him the answer that he wants to hear, let's say. Uh, and the engineer himself may actually honestly believe the testimony he's given. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, one has to be pretty naive not to realize that, that uh, you know, the, the lawyer is hunting for a particular, particular um, answer.